Hi, this is Jack Neville, and you're listening to the Two Furs Angling Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Kleiber from Puget Town Fly Company. This podcast is brought to you by Puget Town Fly Company, a brick-and-mortar fly shop located in Tacoma, Washington. For orders, please call 253-472-2420. They mail all across the United States. And Two Furs Angling, a Washington-based fly fishing guide company with the idea to not only help you catch fish, but teach you how to be a better angler. For booking, please email me, Jack, at twofursangling at gmail.com. That's T-W-O-F-I-R-S-A-N-G-L-I-N-G at gmail.com. Two Furs Angling Podcast is here to help all anglers, regardless of style. We bring you up-to-date product information, interviews with industry professionals, tips and tricks on setting up your gear, fun fishing stories, and knowledge at no charge to you, the angler. Hi, this is Jack Neville with the Two Furs Angling Podcast. Welcome to episode three. I'm here with Matt Kleiber and Lucas Choate of Stargazer Fly Company. What's up? So Lucas is a swing-only uh, guide on the Olympic Peninsula, mostly the Wainuchi and the Satsup, right? Uh, yeah. You do the hump tulips, too. Yeah, not really so much on the Satsup. I would say more on the Wainuchi and the hump tulips. And then yeah. this last season, since everything closed, it was like going and fishing up on the peninsula like the real peninsula kind of more or less yeah, yeah it's funny how like uh if you're like a, a wainuchi guide or whatever and you see them on instagram they always say like an olympic peninsula fishing guide i just don't think of that like as the olympic peninsula that's kind of like its own yeah you know yeah it's weird because it's like that that midpoint between the two you know what i mean because it still is kind of technically the peninsula because it's like the mountains you know what i mean but it's not a coastal river so yeah, it is definitely, uh, you know, it's on the coast. It, it dumps into the Chehalis, which dumps into the... Yeah, I mean, it's not, that, it's not that far. But, I mean, even... But it looks, you know, the further you go up on the Wainuchi, it looks more kind of Olympic Peninsula-y. Mm-hmm. It definitely does, does. especially, moss, yeah, know, up in that section, yeah. But it, it's like that middle ground because it kind of has that farmlandy kind of feel, you know, where like when you go on the sats up, it kind of feels like that, you know? Sure. Or, yeah. like, or the Chehalis, yeah. Yeah, the Chehalis especially. It's like basically if you took the Chehalis and you combined it with an Olympic Peninsula River, you know, one of those like yeah, like the clear water. Definitely um, like not many fly guys as much go down to there it's just not as like well thought of as the olympic mm-hmm. peninsula for whatever reason yeah it's gotta just be because it's just not that you know famous and i think just it can get crowded at yeah. times too like when it's really good water conditions yeah. there's gonna be and it's a weekend there's gonna be a buttload of people there, <laughs> there there's a lot yeah it's, a lot of it's funny because like the wainuchi is super famous with gear fishermen like, yeah gear fishermen love the wainuchi right and the Chehala system like every gear guy yeah, talks about it like as the best river like and, but no fly people like hardly ever talk about it right but what's weird is i will see because i fish it like pretty like you know during the season i'm fishing it fairly regularly Enough to where when I see someone that I haven't seen before, I recognize them, you know what I mean? Mm, you, like, yeah. you, you recognize the, the regulars. Yeah, the regulars, yeah. you know? And I'll still find, like, random new flies that I've never seen before that aren't mine in trees. And <laughs> yeah, I'll be yeah. like, huh, I yeah. wonder who's fishing this, you know what I mean? Like, yes. I've never yeah. even seen this guy. So you know there's people, like, out there that... I think it's way more secret because I'll talk to people who fish the white Nucci. And then I'll be like, they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, this one spot. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then it's just like no one really talks about it. Like, and they always talk about yeah. the 7,400 stuff. Like, I've talked to dudes in Oregon who have fished the Wainuchi before, you know, and like yeah. the water that I fish. Oh, I mean. And they're yeah. like, they're like, yeah, you know, we're like Schaefer Creek dumps in or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's why, you know, it's like, okay, so then you do that. And they're like, yeah, all right, cool. It's definitely a super productive river. Um, but I mean, now it's kind of up in the air, right? This, this winter, whether or not they're going to hold it open. I mean, they had the emergency closure last winter, so it's kind of, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we had all that rain and there was like all the rumors of, you know, the natives not getting their quota or something like that because they're not able to fish as effectively in high water with their nets or whatever. That was kind of like what I heard the most, I think, was something like that. So then, you know, there could have just been a bunch of fish that were blowing up because I remember at the beginning of February or 
Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that was kind of like when we first got back after all that rain. It was like we were catching. I was seeing people catching fish. We were hooking into fish, you know, like crazy. So I, you know that they're in there. It's yes. like, was there no fish or was it that they just weren't catching fish? So then they were saying there wasn't any fish and they closed everything down. Yeah. And so that's kind of a funny one in particular because like it seems like the native uh, people have a lot more say right uh, down there. Yes. Whereas like forks, it's kind of like, I don't know, like 60, 40 toward the guides association. Like they've got a really good guides association that like yeah. pushes really hard on their behalf out in forks. It just seems like the Grays Harbor one isn't quite as, uh, you know, united or whatever, or they don't have as much push, I would say as the, uh, the forks guide association yeah. you know, between the tribe. And I think it's cause it, there's kind of more of a, what do you call it? Like more of a, uh, like fishing is more known kind of in forks, I feel like, in that oh, area yeah. than Grays Harbor. Yes, you know I mean? yeah. completely agree with that. For sure. You know, I mean, there's like, I know guides and people who fish in forks or I have clients even who have mm. fished in forks their whole lives. And then it's like they're going with me on the Wainucci and it's their first time they've ever even like heard of the place or they've heard of it a little bit, but they've never even been there. Or like even the hump tulips, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, it's super funny how many people are like, oh, all I do is go to the hoe or whatever, you know what I mean? The hoe seems to be the most popular one that guys yeah. are like, oh, yeah, I just go to the hoe. That's all I do, like, regardless of the <laughs> conditions or right. anything. And you're like, what? There's like, you know, there's so many rivers that you could go to even closer. But I mean, like, even out in Forks, uh, it's crazy how people just like hold on to one river no matter what and just only fish that. Right. Yeah. But. You're definitely getting it out there a little bit, the Wainucci. Yep. You're one of the only fly fishing guides on it, right? Um, I mean, that I know, you know, regularly. Like, I don't yeah. think there's anybody else that I know. I mean, you got, like, the other, you know, the guides that kind of cover the whole, you know, peninsula or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or the whole coast, you know, that kind of travel around. Yes. But, I mean, other than that, I don't know of anybody else really as much that I do. Yeah who's spay fishing a lot, you know. You'll see guys indicator fishing a lot, but not yeah. as much. I've, yeah, yeah. I've, and then the only guys you see spay fishing are, like, the gear guys that just got a spay rod in their boat type thing. Yeah. Other than that, you know, it's like, that's it. Which doesn't it? really make sense to me because, man, it can be good on yeah. that river. Yes, and it can. that river is freaking gorgeous, too. Like, that is, is one of my... That is one of my favorite like rivers because each each section's got good water too. Yeah. It's not like you know there's one that's not as good as the other. I mean the whole thing is pretty good and it's it's a great. It's got a lot of hatchery fish that go through it. It's got a pretty good you know native population. Yep. I think for everything around you know. I well, mean, the numbers are easily as good as anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. And it, it might not have you know like the crazy monster fish as you know in the quantities that are going to be like in you know more on the coastal rivers. But I've caught and my biggest steelhead that I've caught has been on that river, and that mm -hmm. was like over. It was around like fifteen pounds or something like that. Nice. So yeah. I mean they're in there too. No doubt, there's definitely big fish in that river, and it's. E it's easier access for us quicker to get there than yeah. it is to get out to forks it's killer water like you said it's good whether or not you're swinging or if you're nymphing it's still a great river like it's just a, a killer uh i mean place to go especially like you were talking about up in that upper section it definitely like it doesn't feel like you're in near aberdeen or anything no like, it's not the farmlands you're like way out into the yeah. forest yeah forest. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's nice. It's pretty dense through there too. So you know, a lot of cover and yeah. Well, I mean, like over probably like half of that float right is all that green diamond, uh, you know, forest. Yeah, right? or Rainier or whichever one. Yeah, I don't. A couple different. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's all logging areas. Yeah, so there's no on. houses. Yeah, or there, yeah exactly. Kind of You're like in the first, forest. Yeah. yeah. And then even all that stuff above that too is like prime time, but it gets super bony and narrow yeah from what i've heard i've never gone on it but yeah just looking at google maps going like oh, i want to go there <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there. exactly yeah so yeah well you got the raft right you yeah. can always just walk it over that stuff yeah that'd be a long day yeah. that would be a very long day <laughs> a raft yeah. there's been a lot of i've done a lot of like brainstorming 
on how I'm going to do that. Yeah. So that's just in the works right now. Yeah. We'll see and how that goes. Right now, you're tricking out your raft. You were telling me tricking out the frame in it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're doing an all new, all new design. Pretty much, you know, you buy your boat. And then after a couple years or however however long you go before you're like, all right, I'm going to change this up, that's just where I'm at right now. So yeah. all of my complaints I would have where I'm like, God, this anchor system is just stupid, mm -hmm. you know? Like when I got when I got my, my frame or when I got my boat, I was like, I remember vividly the discussion having with the guy going, okay, I want to get the foot, you know, the foot pedal anchor system on the floor. And he's like, you don't want that. And I'm like, why not? <laughs> And he's like, trust me, you want to have the hand thing. And in my mind, I'm just going, okay, what if I'm in a position where I don't want my, like, I want my raft yeah, to you be want staying to keep rolling, in yeah. one spot and I want to drop my anchor. Instead of, but like, that movement of taking your hand off your oar and grabbing the rope and letting it go, and, you know, that is just so annoying. It sucks when you can just have it all right there. And it's so easy to pull up, you know, with rope yeah. than it is, like, towards you like this with one hand. Yeah, no, it is like in mine. I still have uh, the anchor system that runs from the side, and it, it's definitely harder to to pull than it was in my drift boat, where you just pull straight up. Yeah, because it's such an easier movement. You get your legs behind you that you can lift up with. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a better system, I think, if it runs uh, from the bottom. And you're doing like a whole diamond plated floor, even, and, and some other cool stuff that you're talking about putting in there, just to kind of trick out the raft, because rafts aren't generally speaking as comfortable maybe as a drift boat is um, but there's definitely things that you can do to your frame setup to kind of find that happy medium but people like rafts because you can take them way more places you know yeah yeah pretty much just you know utilizing all the potential space to yeah. have something and not you know and then balancing the weight ratio of that yeah for sure you don't want to put too much stuff and then yeah, yeah. have it be a, a super super heavy yeah. boat yeah because that is one thing i've found with my raft it is very weight sensitive i mean you can feel you know when you have someone in the back as far as not someone having in the back mm -hmm. big it's difference, big yeah. difference or just me being in it by myself it's like man this thing is so i could yeah, i feel any, like i could just time that you're scoop really hard yourself, and i could yeah. jump out of the water if <laughs> yeah I <wanted>. exactly <laughs> it so. is crazy how much easier it is to move the boat if it's just yeah. you yeah. Oh, yeah. It's and then the next thing I'm going to get is I found at Walmart, you can buy a winch that just hooks right up to the back of your truck or whatever uh -huh. for, I think it's like a hundred bucks, an electric winch with a uh -huh. remote. I'm like, I'm, it just, it has the pattern already to just replace your, you know, manual winch. Uh -huh. I'm buying that thing. Oh yeah. You're nice. just going to bolt it. Yeah. <laughs> just turn there's on a, the winch. Yeah. There's a couple boat launches where, you know, you're chilling like this and it's, yeah like annoying to ask your client hey man can you come and like you know pull on this yeah boat, hammer yeah. on my winch right now yeah because it's just you don't want to yeah like you want to be that. able to do it yeah by yourself and so yeah. just right. to be able to pull it out and you know and i'm hooking everything up and just wing. yeah exactly yeah. just pulls it up for you yeah and then you know your clients are like man this guy's badass he's got a sweet <laughs> winch <laughs> i've never, this, this smart, I've never you know? seen some dude yeah. with an electric setup yeah exactly. yeah it's like i don't know why more people don't have that i don't know why yeah people tend to not trick out their uh their boat and get it like super dialed but when you see a guy who has like a super dialed setup you're like oh that's badass mm -hmm. yeah definitely like you i know you like the the in the pavatis how they have the cookie oven <laughs> well i just think it's rad because you can cook pizzas and cookies in there i mean who doesn't that's, want that and when then it's cold and that's another thing that i'm doing to my raft right now so I'm gonna go. That's what I'm talking He's about. Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember how I would just have like the cooler in front of me, and that was kind of my heel bar setup? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna go a smaller cooler to the right, and then I'm gonna go like a. Uh, I've seen at Home Depot you can get these. They just look basic. These basic bar portable barbecuers that you just use those green yeah, tanks yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Or, or I've thought about getting those one gallon propane tanks, and then having that sitting underneath it yeah on the deck but it's like do you need that much propane for one day you yeah. know what i mean no, yeah. that would be if like, you're trying you to save that weight. up like once a month yeah, yeah no you're better off just getting a bunch of the little green guys yeah and twist them one on and then uh you know have that set up right there so you just got boom yeah. cooking station cooler yeah, yeah. and then heated seats i'm gonna get a i want to get a battery <laughs> yeah right? i want to get a battery <laughs> I'm going to get a, a battery in a marine charger. I found this little one on Amazon uh, and just set it in the. So I'm going to have a dry box in the front and back. 
So the front got so it'll replace how there was those two bars that went across where the seat set on. So that's gonna be big dry box, right? Yeah, big yeah. thirty inch dry box and then same underneath me. So then everyone's crap can just be in there. Just over yeah. over that's the nice. over the years of guiding I've learned that I kind of I'm kind of O C D about everyone's you know crap yeah, being yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, it just annoys me when there's trash and crap. Oh, you know, it's so and nice when, it, when it's, it's like, like well put together and you just like yeah. set your, your boat box to the side of you or whatever it is. But yeah, I know when it's everywhere it is a pain. Yeah. Well, a lot of people bring multiple bags, yeah, big yeah, totally. bags. Mm-hmm. It's nice to just store those so that yeah. you know the line's not being caught on anything yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And then that's another thing I'm going to do, too, is I'm just going to weld the whole thing instead of having it because it can break down now into a bunch of pieces. Yeah, yeah. And I hate when I'm going through stuff and you just hear like. Yeah, it all kind of just Yeah, and it's just annoying. So that and then, yeah, heated seats. I'm going to upgrade to that. And then maybe put some LED lights in it, too. So I'm rolling down in the dark. I can see. Yeah, that is one thing because there's especially in the beginning of the winter season. Yeah, it gets dark. Yeah, yeah. So you'll be you know rowing down the river in the dark to get to your first spot. That's what I do a lot of times. Yep. And then it's nice to because I always forget my headlamp to just have lights right there on your boat. So you just (laughs) flick a switch and boom, the whole thing lights up, and I can just be sitting in my heated seat, you know, tying on something like that. Or when you're waiting for the light, you got you know you got your lights going, Mm -hmm. you can get all rigged up, chilling in your heated seat. You got you got the barbecue right. Right there, yeah, yeah, percolating, see? you know, exactly. getting some shit going. Yeah, you can't beat that. Yeah, heated yeah. seats, no, you know. Yeah. So imagine, and like that's what I've been thinking of, you know, is especially in the spay world where you know it's a no-brainer that you're not gonna catch as many fish as guide or as gear guys, right? Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. So it's like. I can see in my clients, you know, body language at the beginning of the day, it changes, you know, towards the midway of the day if we haven't gotten into a fish yet. And it's like just those little things will just start bringing them down, like being cold or not having, you know, yeah, you bring a lunch, but it's like a cold lunch. You know what I mean? So if you're able to have all of these, you know, luxuries on the boat, it just makes the experience so much better because just it's so much harder you know these days than it used to be back in the day for sure and yeah. like you know it's it's so weird how i was uh i was guiding a client this was at the beginning of march this last season and we got done we fished hard for two days like hard and yeah. we had one fish roll on our fly and i think I think each day we had a grab or something, but it wasn't like, you know, super spectacular, Mm -hmm. but he was like, we were fishing good. We were fishing good water. And I was like expecting in all the spots that we were going to, if there was going to one, you know, one there, yeah. Yeah. If there was going to be a fish there, we were going to get one and it just never happened. And I remember the whole day he was just him, not so much like complaining to me, but just kind of venting to someone, you know, about how shitty the steelhead fishing is now and all this stuff. And I'm like, in my mind, I was just like, you know, man, you kind of just got to be happy that you're out here able to do this because yeah. there's going to come a day when we're not even going to be able to fish for these things, you know? For sure. And it's so weird how a month and a half later, literally it closed with all the virus stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I remember driving one day and just randomly that thought came in my mind. I was like, man, I just kind of predicted the future almost in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So in other words, you're quitting your guide career and starting your uh, fortune telling. Yeah. Yeah, yep. exactly. I'm going to yeah. go. I'm going to Hollywood. And <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get one of those little <laughs> yeah, one of those things. shows. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to be me. Yep. <laughs> so. Funny. So what made you get into just swing only? Um, what kind of pushed that, that choice? I think it was because I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to be like every other guide you know what i'm saying i wanted to be really good at one thing is what i want to do and because i don't really like like if i wanted to go fish i only want to go swing i don't really want to do anything else not because it's not like enjoyable it's just the challenge for me and i don't know there's just something about spay fishing that i just love doing you know i just rather do that it's more it's kind of like my zen type thing you know yeah yeah that's kind of my thing and and when I got into guiding, there was the fear, obviously, of, you know, is, am I going to get burnout on fishing from guiding, you know, and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And I've found that there are definitely days where that happens yeah. for sure. sure. But what I've found with myself is that I never, 
like when then the moment the rod gets into my hand it's like everything changes and i yeah and i go back fishing, to being yeah. that little kid again where i get all excited when i go to the river and it's like me fishing it's like yeah. i get to go now you know yeah, yeah. where it's like i'm the i'm the beginner i'm the you know yeah. rather than the guy just giving guidance you know and giving him all of my knowledge and experience to help him you know catch, catch a fish. fish yeah yeah so yeah i never i never lose the the hunt to go well, it's so for rewarding, sure. you know what I mean? Swing, when you, yeah. yeah oh, when yeah. you do hook up. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, it's on, it's time. Like, this is what I've been waiting for. And then yeah. you land that fish, and you're like, yep, I'm addicted. Yeah. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah. heading to the shop. I'm going to pick up this, this, and this. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's uh, it, it's powerful. Well, yeah. especially because you're fishing for the hardest fish to catch in the state, like, and you're fishing it the hardest way to catch that fish. Yeah. Right. Like, you're just like purposefully putting yourself in the least advantageous uh like way to catch a fish that <laughs> right. it could possibly be yeah and so for sure you're like kind of a badass when, when you catch yeah, one right you're like yeah i did it man like i caught one the hardest way possible yeah and there's definitely a lot of it that too you know and and the way i feel is it's like you just won the super bowl you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that's kind of the same. Yeah. That's how you feel when you stick one on the swing. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. like, I just won the Super Bowl this year. Like, yeah. that's how you feel. <laughs> yeah. Because it's kind of, you know, for the av- I would say for the average, you know, weekend warrior dude who's got a normal job and he can't yeah. go. He only gets to go maybe like four weekends a year or something like that, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's probably, that's like his season. And then yeah. it's like, he's going to get one at one time. You know what I mean? He's gonna he, and so yeah, when I mean, he gets w- his one, that's his one for the year, and it's like boom. I would say the vast majority of guys who steelhead fish maybe get one a year. Yeah, maybe two, and that's like, but uh, like you said, they're probably going out five weekends or whatever, yeah. maybe uh, a season, and they're hoping to get one. And so yeah, no, you definitely feel like a a huge, uh, you know, experience. Yeah, <laughs> when you actually do swing one up, you're like. Yeah. yeah, and those guys probably don't have boats, you know what I mean? So yeah, always sure. hiking and stuff mm-hmm. like yep. that. Like I would say that's probably your average spay guy. Yeah, you know, for sure not, is a guy who's guide. hiking in and then yeah. swinging flies, hoping to get something. Yeah, and then you got your hardcore, you know, dudes with their own boats and stuff that are mm-hmm. basically just as good as guides, probably better actually because they just get to fish all the time. Yeah. So they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not yeah. having, you know, none of the pressure. Yeah. Well, they're not trying to teach anybody. They're just yeah. fishing, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, they're fishing more than you are. You're just on the water more yeah. than they are. Yeah, exactly. So, but, you know, that's the that's that's why I guide is for two reasons. One, it's extremely challenging. You know, it's like going from you want to be a spay angler. Okay, you know, you're successful at that. That's mm-hmm. pretty, you know, that's, that's pretty impressive. Well, for then sure. if you're going to guide only that way. Or yeah. if you're going to do, you know, guided trips that way where you're only swinging, it's like to be able to get a client to, you know, hook into a fish and then land it guiding swing only. For me, I'm like, that's that's even, you know, gnarlier than just getting them on the swing with by yourself. Yeah, for sure. And then then the other thing that gets that the reason why i only do it is because just seeing the look on the client's face when right when i stick it and i look up at them they're just like oh my they are yeah. so jacked <laughs> yeah. yeah it is that moment you get to to get to have with your client when they stick their steelhead because a lot of them you know they don't catch them all the time or it could oh, be their sure. first one yeah. or they haven't caught one in a while they haven't had a grab in a while or whatever it is yeah. so when they get to get one it's like a big deal and i yeah. think it's a big deal too i mean every time i get to net a steelhead i'm like yep. oh, yeah this yeah. is yeah. bad ass so yeah. it's like you know yeah. for sure so those two things that's why i like doing it so much because a lot of times too i've found you know, especially in the spay world, the more difficult the fishing is you're trying to do where there's not as many people that are successful at it. So your your clients are going to be more, you know, I wouldn't say appreciative, but it's just like it feels like the experience is just so much bigger because it's just such a bigger deal than going out gear fishing or whatever to where yeah. it's like you're expecting to catch fish. Right. You know, yeah. a lot of my clients, like, you know, they're going with a guide, so they're expecting they're going to get some action, you know, and that's what I tell them. I, I can't guarantee you're going to land a fish. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I can guarantee that if it's the right time of year and the water conditions are really good, you know, if they're ideal, I can guarantee we're probably going to find fish. If it's yeah. the peak of the season, we're going to see fish. Something's going to happen. Yeah. 
you know, I can't guarantee every single time it's going to happen. And then when you have one on, I can't guarantee that you're going to keep it on, you know, because right. then and then and that's why that's why spay guiding is so challenging is because you have no control of anything but their leader. You know, you can control their flies. You can mm-hmm. you can tie their knots for them. Yeah. But you're not the one casting the rod. You're not the one fighting the fish. You're not the one putting them. You can. You know, if you want to swing from the boat, you can do that. That's kind of the only way you can really kind of control them. Yeah. Like, and that's, but a lot of, you know, uh, anglers don't want to fish from the boat. I mean, I hate fishing from the boat. You mm-hmm. don't have that natural kind of like feeling like you're, you yeah. know, fishing for steelhead. And that's, I think, what a lot of spay guys are is they're like the purest, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I don't think, for me, you know, I consider myself like a, diehard spay guy but i don't really consider myself like a purist like every time someone's like oh you're a fly fisherman you're like a purist i'm like nah not really i just (laughs) like spay fishing man i don't really like because i don't even i mean i like you know doing nymphing and stuff for steelhead like that's fun like it's fun you know to go down the river have you know some beers and stuff like that and then just go and just have a fun time just nymphing down the river like that's fun but you know for me like my true you know if you want to call it passion or whatever i just like swinging flies and so, yeah. Every time you go fishing, even with you bring your gear, do you uh, end up swinging? Like, just personally? Yeah, just like, uh, I'm going to step out and swing this run real quick. I would say, you know, because I don't have, not all my friends spay fish. So, if I'm rowing, you know, they're always gear fishing. The only time, the only time I'll gear fish is if I'm trying to, you know, research water. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm going to go l- n- learn a new river, or like a new section of a river, I'll just get all my buddies who got gear rods and I'll just pile them all in my boat and just be like, all right, let's just go dredge this whole river and see where we can find fish. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, after a while you get pretty good at knowing where fish should be, you yeah. know, but then there's going to be always those rando spots where you're like, wow, that's weird. I would never expect a fish to be there. And yeah. then you kind of think about it more and you think about you know, how many river, how many river miles are up the river? What kind of structure was below, you know, what's down river, what's up river. You think about those things and you go, yeah, I guess, I guess I could see fish holding mm-hmm. up here. That would make sense why they'd be here, you know, or like, you know, water levels and stuff like that. There's all that stuff that plays into where steelhead are going to be. Right. Right. So definitely people who nymph, uh, you know, guides and stuff who nymph, uh, definitely pretty frequently, uh, at least when I've talked to them, I've said like, yeah, for sure. Nymphing is like swinging's cool. That's the fun way to catch them and stuff. But nymphing is also important, at least to their business. Cause again, like it, like you said, it kind of tells them where the fish are. Yeah. And then you've got kind of a pretty good idea where the fish are at in the system and where they're holding and stuff. And you can learn that stuff over time, just swinging flies, but it's going to take you a lot longer. So long. Yeah. I did for that sure. for about a year when I first started, like, cause I never, I gear fished for steelhead mm-hmm. when I first started for about a year and a half or so. And then I went straight into swinging and then I only swung f- for probably a year and a half, maybe two years before I started guiding, mm-hmm. just swinging. I never touched a gear rod. All my friends yeah. would go out, we'd go out, you know, fishing. They'd all have gear rods. I'd never, like, even yeah. if I couldn't, like, we'd be in a spot where it's, like, impossible for me to swing, but I'd be out there trying to do it. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, yeah. And then, and then I'd catch fish, you know, and then I'd try to learn rivers and stuff, but it would take so long. And I was yeah. so hard-headed. I'm like, I'm never, I'm only gonna spay fish. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you just kind of go, like, you know what? I mean, I could find out instantly right now if there's a fish right there. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Yep. It's like, all right, I guess I'll do that. And then, you know, you kind of balance the yeah, definitely. two, I guess. That's kind of like your research, you know, is when you're doing the gear fishing. And then, you know, it's, it's test time when it's, when it's swinging flies. Yeah. In Alaska, when we'd go silver fishing, we'd have a spinning rod with a mm-hmm. spinner, this giant chartreuse spinner. And we'd call it the fish finder because there'd be a, you'd be fishing a, river like the size of the callots and it's that murky or it'd be like the toodle kind of you know it's like that murky color Mm -hmm. and you'd be sitting in a spot and like yeah there should be silvers right here you know it makes sense throw that thing out there yep they're in there yep all right fish finder (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) that's definitely a good way to do it so when did you start fishing in general you started out gear fishing you were saying right yeah so i think just like a lot of people you know when you're little if your Mm -hmm. dad kind of brought you into it we growing up we we did a lot more ocean fishing i would say and like the columbia and stuff okay. like that i never really fished small rivers yeah. growing up so 
when I was 17 or so was the first time I really started getting into river fishing. Sure. And then, yeah, my one of my baseball teammates, younger brother, was like one day at a, like after a football game or something like that, was seeing if I wanted to go steelhead fishing the next day. And I was like, hell yeah, let's go. So then we went, and then the whole day it was out on the Skookum truck, and I was like, this is so cool. I want to do this all the time. And then that wasn't even with spay fishing. So got pretty pretty hooked onto that. And then and then uh, graduated high school, started working on wind turbines, traveling around the country. And my best friend who lives in Wyoming would send me pictures of him fly fishing for trout and stuff like that. And I was yeah. like, man, that's so badass. I'm going to start fly fishing. So I went to Walmart, bought the cheapest combo setup you can get. Yeah. And it had a foam, you know, a black foam handle. Like it was so cheap. It was, yeah, the court or not Cortland, but it was some, um, you know, the yeah, yeah, Walmart super cheap brand, brand or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And so went out, just taught myself how to cast. My first fish I caught on a fly was a smallmouth bass. Um, there nice. was a million. I was in, where was I in? I was in Illinois. And there was this river where there was so many carp, these massive carp. And I'm out there with my little five-weight fly rod. And I'm like, I want to hook into one of these things so bad. I don't know how to get them to eat my fly. I'm like, I'm drifting it over them. I'm, I got these massive poppers that I'm like trying to use as dry flies. I have no yeah, yeah. idea what I'm yep. doing. It's like, I'm like, just, and I can see them, you know, sipping on, you know, something at the top of the water. But I didn't have anything small enough. So. Yeah. And I would, I would throw a rock at them, and they would just take off, and they, you could tell that they had some shoulders on them. And I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure they would snap my five weight right in half. Yeah. Yep. Whatever. So, yeah, so I would just fly fish as I would travel around the country uh, working on wind turbines. And then one time, I think, uh, like... I don't know, maybe like six months or a year or so into my fly fishing career, I was like, people got a steelhead, like fly fish for steelhead. That's got to be a thing. Because I didn't know anybody. You yeah, know? yeah. No one taught me anything. I was just kind of like getting into this all on my own. So I just went on YouTube, typed in fly fishing for steelhead, and then literally the first video I see is a dude with a spay rod. Like it's snowing, you know yeah. what I mean? It looks gnarly, and he's like out there making a cast, and then you just see him just come tight and – they're showing the flies and these Mondo chrome fish. And I'm like, I want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. That is exactly what I want to do. That looks like the most badass thing ever. And like... It looks like it sucks so bad, but it's like I. It's like when you do it though, it's like yeah. that's a big deal. It's like anybody who does, you know, like ma like mountain climbing or anything, yeah. or rock climbing, you know, like, or you know, dirt bike racing or anything like action sports, skateboarding, being, you know, anything like where you're kind of risking your life. Even though we go out steelhead fishing, we're not really risking our lives. No, but, yeah. You know, it sucks waking up at three o'clock in the morning if you have to. It sucks being out there when it's yeah. super cold. I don't yeah. like doing that at all. That's why no. I'm getting heated seats in my boat. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so. It, it is almost exactly like mountain climbing where like if you just looked at like climbing up the mountain you'd be like that sounds awful it's super cold it's like crazy hard like why would you want to do that your shoes are so yeah. uncomfortable and the, and the guy's like well no i just want to get to the top and you're like you're an idiot like yeah. why would you put yourself through that just to get to the top everybody says the same thing when you explain winter steelheading you're like yeah no it's like 34 and pouring down rain and yeah i'm gonna go camp out there and then i'm gonna go wake up at like 4 30 in the morning to get ready and get get in the water and launch the boat in the dark and yeah that's what i'm gonna do with my day and maybe i'll catch a fish like maybe if i'm if i really nail it i'll catch a fish mm -hmm. today and everyone would be like you're an idiot like that yeah. sounds like the worst day ever for maybe a fish like yeah. that's awful and you're like, no, it's the most fun. Like, you just don't understand. You just have to be super into suffering, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, being out there, but, you know, the reward. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's pretty much all I ever have on my mind is, okay, it happens. it's it's ice cold. Yeah. It's raining. There's snow mixed in there. Yeah. But you hook up and you're like, yep, that was worth it. Completely worth it. All right. You know, I'll do it again tomorrow. Yeah, it's so weird how, how like that is a thing. Cause there, there will be times where you know you go a week or so. I mean, for me as a guide, you know, the the longer or the shorter periods of time seem longer to us. You know what I mean? Cause we're out there all the time. You know, if you're full time guiding, and so 
you go a week and you're just like, man, I think I'm going to quit. This sucks. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, or you'll like, like that, that'll be going through my mind, you know, maybe not so much quitting, but it's like, God, what am I doing? I need to figure it out, you know? And then all of a sudden a client will get a grab or something or we'll land a fish or whatever. And then it's like, all right, I'm the, I'm the dude now. And you'll, you know, you'll start going on for a little while and then you go back down into a slope, you know, and cause, and that's the thing. I think another thing that makes it so challenging is you just, there's, you can't control. There's so many variables to the game, you know, especially for swinging. You just can't, yeah. you got it because yes, it's all is. about, you just got to know where the fish are. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I found for me, at least the best advice I can give to somebody who's swinging is it's like, yeah, you can swing a nice looking piece of water, but there will probably that, you know, there's sections of river where fish will literally never be there ever. Yeah. The only time they will be there is if they get spooked over there. You yeah. know, so you could be wasting your time. You could be looking at a piece of water and go, man, this is so this is perfect depth, perfect clarity, perfect yeah. speed. Fish don't move on that side. They move on the other side of the river. Yeah, you know? yeah. for and sure. And so then and you just can't. And then there's, you know, spots for steelhead hold where you literally can't swing. But gear guys can run bobbers through it like it's nothing and just, you know, pull fish right out. For sure. That's something that a lot of dudes, especially guys who switch over into swinging, don't seem to understand is like. There's just spots where you can't swing a fly. And there's spots where you can't bobber dog that you can swing a fly exactly. and still catch fish. So, I mean, it's just different water. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, uh, oh, excuse me. So, you were doing the wind turbines. Uh, yeah. And then, like, what made you just decide you were going to be a guide? Yeah. So, you know, as my spay fishing game got better um, and my... I don't know what you'd call it. I just started getting more burnout working on wind turbines just because not that I wasn't, I didn't like my job, but it was just, it was getting boring. You know, I just was like, just not really enjoying life. Um, it was just routine, you know, I just, but I had spay fishing that I would always like try to make time to go do. Yeah. It was like, I was always getting out of work. I was always like wanting to go do that. Yeah. I'd drive, you know, five hours to go to a river to go fish for the weekend if i could fish it for like just the afternoon like i would yeah. wake up drive all the way there fish it for the afternoon and then drive all the way back to go to work you know yeah. so 10 hours of driving just to swing like three or four runs totally. you know because that's like all i could get yeah and so yeah i was getting to that point and then i was in wisconsin uh doing a job over there and i walk into the fly shop and I'm like, hey, you know, looking to do some fishing. I think I had like a, an 11, like an 11, six, seven weight with me at the time, a sure. switch rod with me. Yeah. And I walk in, it's uh, the Tight Lines Fly Shop over in Milwaukee, I think. I can't remember where I was at. Sure. But over there in Wisconsin, like they're kind of more famous. Yeah, I've heard of Fly them. Shop. And so, um, yeah, I walk in there and I'm looking around. There's pictures of brown trout and rainbows and smallmouth and stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just looking at some fishing. Just kind of, you know, point me in the right direction. He was telling me some spots to go. And he's like, yeah, it's kind of not really the time of year for browns. And it was that, let's see, it was like end of September, I think. And okay. so I'm, and then I'm looking around some more. And I'm seeing pictures of steelhead. And I'm like, man, there's got to be, or I was like, you guys got steelhead around here? And he's like, oh, yeah. And I was like, all right, screw all that brown trout stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. where, where do we go? Steelhead, where yeah. do we go for steelhead? And he's like, if you don't mind driving, I was like, I don't mind driving. And he's yeah. like, well, five hours north, there's this river called the Brule River. I was like, okay, totally can do that. Yeah. He's like, yeah, dude, right now is literally the peak of the run. And I'm like, yes. So the next weekend, I had a, like a three day weekend drive up there after work just go find on google maps this campground yep. like this little 30 lot you know no hookups nothing yep. get there at midnight it's pouring down rain the gates closed so i'm just sleeping in my truck wake up go into town get some coffee come back get to the river it's blown out so i'm like shit all <laughs> yeah. right well i'm it's it's not it's just brown it's you yeah. can tell it's not blown out but it's not yeah, a very yeah. big river it's yeah. like I would say it's double. I would say it's double the Skookum Chuck in spots, um, okay. but that kind of smaller size river, kind of like the Upper Sats up. Okay. And so, yeah, I'm just kind of fishing around, and I caught like a little brown trout or something, and and I was like, all right, well, this is kind of lame. And it's like nine or ten o'clock, and I still haven't seen anybody on the river. 
and I'm like, is this guy full of shit? Like, did he just tell? Because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, where is yeah. everybody? I'm yeah. like, if this is supposed to be like the shit right now, like, how come there's? And then around like that nine ten o'clock, people started just showing up to go fishing, and I'm oh, like, oh really? What? going on around here yeah, this is exactly. weird i'm like i'm like you guys don't even like wake up early to go fishing i'm like yeah. because in washington where i'm from you gotta be there like oh in pitch black. dudes dudes will put headlamps on the trees the night before and just leave them on so it looks and they'll just be on all night long yeah. you know what i'm saying like there's stuff like that that goes on so i was like whatever i'm gonna go i'm gonna go get a camp spot right you know because i'm yeah. gonna camp the weekend so i get the last spot i'm driving through the campground and everyone in there is fishing. Everyone's fly fishing. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm gonna go into town. I'm gonna get a jug of whiskey. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna make friends with these people yeah. and figure out where I gotta go to get these steelhead. So go into town, get some whiskey, come back, park, become friends with my neighbor, convince him to trade casting lessons for like steelhead spots. And so we were just gonna go fishing the next day. We go out, get to our first run. Pretty nice run. You could tell that like there's definitely the chance of steelhead being in here. Um, don't get anything. Uh, come to find out that there's a spay clave going on on a cabin on the river, like down the road from where we're at at noon. And so he's like, hey, man, we should go swing this run by the spay clave, and then we'll go to the spay clave. And I was like, all right, cool. So we go swing this run. I hook into two steelhead, and they were probably in that 28 like to 32 range like not like crazy big but like good size fish yeah for and sure. yeah. or maybe not 32 like 26 to 28 what was i thinking mm. and they were some of the most hardest fighting fish i've ever gotten into i remember i'm sitting in this run and i was swinging this inside bend on a river right kind of weird scenario log jam setup and I'm looking around, my, my line's coming across. I'm like, God, this thing is swinging so good right now. I'm like, yeah. there's a fish there. They're so going to boom. <laughs> it just crushes it. Yeah. Rip in line, fish comes jumping out of the water. I'm like screaming. I'm having such a good time. And so then that fish gets off right at the bank. And then uh, I think third cast later, hook into another one. I don't know if it's the same fish or not or whatever. It, it ate it at the, basically the same spot. So there's probably just more than one. And then go to the spay clave. Everyone there is just learning how to like skagit cast, which mm -hmm. was strange to me because I was like, wait a minute, you guys don't know how to do this stuff? Like, this isn't new technology. This is, you know, been going on yeah, over since the 90s. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, everyone was super into it. And then that's where I kind of realized, like, I realized, like, oh, I'm actually like kind of decent at this stuff. I guess mm -hmm. compared to all you people, like, yeah. because they were talking to me and it was the first time where I was like, whoa, like, I'm around people that like are kind of like, you know, crazy about this stuff like I am too. And it was fun to communicate with people like how we're doing kind of now about fishing and stuff yeah. and like spay fishing, especially, For sure. which is what I really liked doing. Yeah. And so in that moment, I was like, whoa, I went from kind of that mindset of, you know, working on wind turbines and going to work hungover every day and just like going to the bar after work to like, damn, I like want to like kind of give a shit now about life yeah and like mm -hmm. i want to so i was like after that event i was like man i really want to consider changing career paths and just going from understanding that like yeah i may not be rich you know or whatever have a bunch of money but at least i'm going to be like happy you know what i'm saying because yeah. up to that point i was like i just feel i just felt like i was just burnt out and i just wanted something new and so then i was like ah eh, screw it i'm just gonna go for it and see what happens and I told myself, I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to strive, you know, to be the best. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to be realistic at the same time. You know, I'm like, especially these days, you know, a steelhead not being as good as, you know, it used to be back in the day. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I'll give it, you know, five, five, six, seven years. And if it's just not working out, then I'll be like, all right, you know, I tried. But I didn't want to be, you know, 50 years old or whatever and have a nice, you know, house and family and all that stuff, which is good, you know, if that's what you want. But I didn't want to be in that position and be sitting there and going like, man, I wish I would have tried guiding when mm -hmm. I didn't have like any, it was the perfect time for me to do it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Because you don't have any responsibility. Yeah, yeah don't exactly. I was like, I want to try it and see if I can do it, you know? And then if not, like, all right, well, at least I tried because I don't want to like, you know, regret that one day. Yeah. That's pretty much everybody in the fly fishing industry is kind of accepted that they pretty much hate life at a normal job and they're like okay i guess i'm gonna <laughs> go do fly yeah. fishing then like i'll be poor but at least i won't hate being alive <clears throat> i think um i think your income is just really about how hard you want to work 
you know, and yep. there's kind of certain limitations. I mean, if you're a full time guide and you're guiding like five days out of the week, mm-hmm. you're making a good income, actually. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like if you have yeah. your own if you have your own LLC, if you're your yep. own guide, you know, you're not guiding for an outfitter. If you have your own business, you're making a pretty good living, like a good, respectable living. Mm-hmm. But it is really hard to have all your client, you know, to have your full year completely booked that's really hard i mean i'm not at that stage oh it's yet, crazy you know hard I mean? to build clients yeah, yeah it takes a while it just yeah. takes time yeah and so that's where a lot of guides you know don't guide full time is because they're doing other things they got another job you know yep. what i mean so there's not that many people who guide full time no no they're really because it's tough to book enough clients yeah especially with steelhead numbers dropping becomes tougher and tougher for especially in the winter time for guys to book clients and there's not that many people who want to swing flies or steelhead you know on the fly in general like there's just you're right you're taking already a selective group of people that's hard to book clients for and then you're like okay but we're only going to do it on the fly and then that drops off like at least two-thirds of guys who could be potential clients you know right yeah yeah which is why i have started to get back into the nymphing game it's because it's like I started understanding that I'm going to I'm still doing, you know, swing only trips. Like that's yeah. like really what I want to do. But yep. if guys want to go out and nymph, it's like you want to go hang drywall or do you want to go, you know, row a boat for dudes nymphing? <laughs> yeah, you know yeah I mean? for sure. Yep. It's like I would kind of rather do that. So. Yeah, yeah. No, well, there's definitely. like that happy medium too. Yeah. Know? Yeah, or doing like a half half day. Yeah, for sure. Which is kind of what I uh, like that's my favorite to do. Cuz oh, I, I feel yeah. like I'm I am fishing the most effective way that i can by swinging you know like the in my opinion the best gravel bars on the river and then in like deep slots nymphing through those yeah i would say yeah if you want to have like the full kind of experience of fly fishing for steelhead that's definitely the way to go but if you wanted to like get the highest possibility of catching one it would definitely be nymphing only for sure yeah because you're gonna have yeah not even close you're gonna cover so much more water yeah so much more effectively by nymphing the entire way yeah it's not even close yeah Yeah. no for sure and you can kind of find like matt said a happy medium between the two by kind of doing some nymphing and doing some swinging but yeah for sure no i mean nymphing is definitely the most effective way to catch steelhead on the fly yeah not even not even sometimes (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So if you could make your own, you know, run to to nymph or to swing through, sorry. Nymphing would be I mean, that's a pretty easy run. It's just a deep slot with some woods on the side. Yeah, yeah. my nymphing but, run, I would want to be like about this wide. <laughs> yeah, he's holding about, about a foot and right about now. This deep, this <laughs> about wide and about this deep foot with foot, like basically. pea gravel, so there's nothing gonna get snagged yeah, or yeah. anything, you know. <laughs> you just run your nymph tight, the whole way down. Tight yeah. channel of current to where yeah. there's no question where the fish is gonna be. It's yeah, gonna yeah. be right there. That's yep. the perfect nymphing spot super short so that way you just high stick it you don't even have to mend the whole way mm-hmm. and, and it's a completely clear bank so you just walk right alongside oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The yep. <laughs> yeah exactly but your perfect swing run what are you looking for like if you if you had the dream run what's it look like man it's weird because i feel like every river i fish there's one of those runs on that river where i'm like this is this, this is, is it, it. Yeah. Draw it exactly. yeah. this is what That's it looks this is what it would look like but I mean, I really enjoy, like, it doesn't even have to be, you know, maybe a run or just the style of a river. Like, I really enjoy rivers the size of the Wainuchi where they got big boulders mm-hmm. and, you know, fairly deep kind of clearish water. I'm not, I, honestly, I hate big rivers so much. Mm-hmm. I hate big rivers. It's Wainuchi's just, probably what, like, 50 60 feet wide most of the time yeah i would say yeah in that upper section gets yeah. bigger the further yeah. down you yeah. go like down toward that farmland section you're probably looking at like maybe 80 100 feet in some sections you know big wide bends but yeah probably overall yeah probably you know you're like just, 60 80 feet yeah just your medium sized rivers you yeah know, if, you, if you consider the cowlitz like a big river yeah i hate swinging yeah. the cowlitz and then for just, people who don't know the cowlitz it's huge like you're probably what like 150 feet maybe 
close to yeah, 200 through a lot of sections. Yeah, it just depends yeah. on, and then it depends on, you know, the flow. But For sure. I, I like those medium to smaller, you know, where a 12 foot spay rod is perfect. That's yeah. my favorite length yeah. of rod to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then. Definitely agree with that. For, 100%. Yeah, no, I'm with that. Yeah, for, uh, and for just kind of what I look for in a run, yeah, like big boulders but a nice even run to where when you're casting there's no you don't have to try that hard to mend if you got like that weird back eddy and you're casting across the river type yeah, thing yeah but and then to where i only gotta i only gotta cast like t11 or something like that with an unweighted fly so yeah, like yeah. three feet deep four feet deep yeah. Yeah, that's that's money, and then cool. You know, I'm all about the the scenery around the the run. I don't really yeah. care that much about what's in the water. You know, well, because if you're if you're swing only, you're probably not going to catch anything. So the scenery better be yeah. super cool, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just like to Pretty. give Lucas a hard time sometimes for his, his swing only methods. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but a lot of times like. I don't know. I don't really have one, you know, kind of like dream run, I think, in my yeah. mind. Just saying earlier when I was saying, like, each river has its own spot. Because sure. I'm just brainstorming right now all of my favorite runs I like to fish. And they yeah. all have different reasons why I For like sure. to fish them. And it all kind of stems from the difficulty of them. I like fishing really difficult spots. Because yeah. when you get one out of there, it's like, what? You yeah, got yeah. a fish <laughs> on the swing out of there? Yeah, yeah. Like, what I really enjoy fishing is heavy sections of water where uh -huh. like, you know, you'll have, let's just say a rock garden for, for, for instance, and there'll be a little soft pocket on the edge. Well, those fish will go up and they'll pull off in that soft pocket, especially when they got a heavy section of water because yeah. they want to take a break. If they yeah. can take a break going through, you know, for sure. heavy current. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of fish there that hold a lot of the times. Yeah. And so it's a great spot to fish. But when you hook one in there, if they decide to go back into that heavy water, they are turning and burning down river. And so it's like, now you got to get in the boat and yeah. get in and go chase that thing before it goes into backing and then just, you know, rips off. So stuff like that, exciting fishing or where yeah. you're standing on a boulder and you're making this monster cast and it's the only way to get there. You can't go to the other side. This is like, if it's going to happen, it's only going to happen right here. Or if yeah. you have to park your boat and then you got to hike down to, cause you can only fish from this side. You can't reach them from the other side type mm -hmm. thing. And you're scaling down this bluff, you know, it's kind of like the, like if you're a bow hunter and it's mm -hmm. the stock, you know what yeah. I mean? Like that's what I love doing. I love finding steelhead or knowing where they're going to be. That's why I love summer summer steelhead fishing so much because you can spot them. Yeah. And so, and in the wintertime too, especially in the spring when it's, there's not as much water, you can spot fish too. Yeah. And, um, especially but being the able last to, couple of years. Yeah. Being able to spot them, stock them, make a stock down to them, mm -hmm. you know, to where on the fifth cast, you're getting the connection. That yeah. is, <laughs> that is so much fun. And a lot of times too, for clients, they really enjoy that too. And I love when I'll tell them like, Hey man, all right, so grab your stuff. We're going to go for a little hike. And then halfway through, they're like, come on, like, do we got it? It's like, come on, like, just trust me. Like, and yeah. I only really do that when I am, when I know there's a fish there. Like if yesterday I seen one there, yeah, cause yeah. a lot of times when the water's lower and you spot fish, they don't really move from day to day that much, you know, weekly. Yeah. Kind of, I've found they seem to move more, but even weekly too. Sometimes I'll see yeah, a fish. Yeah, if there's no in rain, the... they're probably not gonna move. Nah, they're just gonna like hold they, in that same spot. There's things that push them to move, but yeah, no, I mean, if it, especially like low clear conditions, they definitely seem to yeah. hold for a long time in the same spot. If like if that's if they're gonna be spawning in that area, mm -hmm. for sure. But yeah. I've found too, even in low clear water, I'll see pods of fish moving up. But you can tell they're fresh fish, so yeah. there'll be the difference of the fresh fish and the you know the fish that have been hanging out for a while because they're gonna spawn somewhere yeah because i'll be going down i'll see a fresh red and then you'll look in the fast water and boom there's the steelhead sitting there mm -hmm. and then you'll see them um, that same fish maybe further down in the pool a next couple of days later because they've just spawned or they're mm -hmm. you know they're they got pushed down there and then you'll yeah. see them again back up on that red or they'll be up kind of more up in the tail out so um yeah being able to you know see the differences in that is pretty cool but back to spotting fish and being able to, you know, hunt them more or less. That is what I enjoy the most. And then yeah. like this last, this last fall summer steelhead fishing, when I got back from Alaska, the, we had an killer 
week of fishing. Like the best swing fishing. We got into one every single day. Um, one day we got three before noon. Like it was oh, wow. just, it was just insane. And my client at the time, I, just, I was telling him when I netted that third fish at like 1130, I was like, this don't, he was a first time client, don't get used to this. This is <laughs> yeah, not yeah, like yeah, normal. Yeah, like that, and this I was his first this, day yeah. fishing with me. Yeah. And so he was going to go for three days and I was like, don't get used to this. And then I've gone with him. I don't know, like five times after that, and we've touched fish, but it wasn't like that first time, and we oh, always yeah. go back to that first day of just like that was so killer. <laughs> That's but like so, a once yeah. in a lifetime at best. Yeah. yeah, especially here in Washington is the thing. Yeah, and so, but I really equate that to we were the only people on the river. Yeah, and you could tell no one's been fishing it. It was low water mm -hmm. fish. Those summer steelhead, they like to hang in that little faster water, you know. So yep. they were super easy to swing to. It was just really, it was the perfect ideal conditions to have a great day like that. Which for steelhead is like the most important thing, is right? Conditions. It's. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, that's that's what I like when I guess how successful we're going to be in the morning. It's going to be all on those variables and so for that day we just literally had the perfect scenario possible yeah and that's why we we you know got the fish what we did but later that week we had some more rain and there was a bunch of leaves that were going through and the mm -hmm. water got kind of dirty and so i was having a client swing through this spot and literally two days ago we hooked into two fish i think landed one and had two or three other fish come on jump you know who yeah. knows it could have been the same fish whatever but i mean we've had we were having that action so when i was standing up on the bank you couldn't see anything in this tail out and i was like i know there's fish here and i know there's one i can vaguely see this rock and that was where these fish were hanging around this rock i'm like i know there's got to be i think i can see one barely from the bank and so my client is swinging through and the water was up and he was getting to the point where he was starting to get a little deeper and he's like i don't know if i want to go any further down i was like you just need to go down like 10 more feet just trust mm -hmm. me just go down like 10 yeah, more exactly. feet and so he goes down a little bit further and it was like, it was cool because he was at his limit, right? Yeah. You could tell that he didn't want to go any further. Yeah. He could, but he, if he was fishing by himself, he would have stopped right there. Right? Yeah, yeah. He literally stepped down one more time, made the same exact cast. And it was probably a difference of five to six feet, not very mm. far, or maybe even less than that. Maybe only like four feet. He might've yeah. only stepped down four feet. And then I'm watching his line come across. I'm like, get ready, get ready, get ready. And it went right in front of that rock. And then you just hear him go, there he is, there he is. And I see his rod man. And yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, that was <laughs> awesome. Like literally play yeah. by play nailed it with yeah. blind, you know, not even seeing the fish. Yeah, totally. And so, yeah, he was super pumped. Nice, beautiful native summer run fish. That's one thing too about those, those summer runs on the Wainuchi. I mean, a lot of them are just perfect. They're not very big, but, mm -hmm. you know, the natives, you know, they kind of are in that medium range, but they are just perfect, just beautiful. I love them. Mm -hmm. Steelhead are, like, just such an amazing fish to look at. Like, you could just look at pictures of steelhead and be like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 So definitely when you get one to hand, you're like, this is unreal. Like this fish went through so much to get here. Like <laughs> now I'm on this. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. For sure. So, so what are you running for gear now? You're mostly doing like skagit heads, 12 foot rods. Yeah. So, um, let's see. It really all depends on, yeah, I would say 12 foot, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. In that range, my rods, spay rods I got right now are actually 13 sixes. I got those for rental, you know, client rods. Yeah, it's totally. a good, it's a good length with a six, 600 grain head. Sure. Just a Rio Skagit Max. It's a good setup for beginner people because that's what I anticipate when someone's using this rod is they probably yeah, never spay exactly. casted before yeah, in their they're, life. There's someone who, who doesn't own their own Yeah, stuff. so yeah. I've found with like a longer, a longer kind of stiffer rod with a shorter, heavier head, it's easier to get it to go out and just cast the Skagit head. Because if you can just cast the Skagit head, you can fish a lot of places Yeah, I mean, where yeah. fish are going to be. Because I think there's a difference, you know, you don't have to cast very far to catch steelhead because a lot of times where the steelhead are going to be holding 
you can just walk up to them or you can get close enough yeah. to them to where you don't have to make a far cast. If yeah. you got a bow, you know, or if you can hike to them, you know, if you can get to that side of the river. Yeah. The only time you really need to cast far is if you can't get closer to the fish. And so it's good to be a, you know, a distance caster or be able to, you know, cast far, but, you know, it's not crucial to your fish success to be able to cast far definitely not people you know, get way too caught up in, yeah. in distance casting and spay casting in particular and they're fishing like clear to the other side of the river and they're not mending and it's just a terrible yeah. swing and you're like that's pointless like yeah what you're doing right now is never going to catch you fish if you did like a 60 foot cast you'd probably catch fish you yeah. know and instead you're trying to bomb out these 100 foot casts and your head's not turning over and yeah, yeah. you just get a piled up mess out there yeah and that's why i hate fishing big rivers is because a lot of the times you have to make a far cast is because you're just fishing a big river so mm -hmm. it's like you know where the fish are going to be holding is going to be in the same spot that they would be holding in the smaller river it's just they're closer to you now mm -hmm. so the bigger the river gets it's like man i hate stripping in a thousand times <laughs> and then making this cast and then it's you know that's where the, the environmental conditions come into play when you're trying to make a long cast because if there's a little bit of wind or anything and then you got all your running line hanging down yeah. and it gets knotted up all the time it's like yeah. no matter what brand of shooting line or running line you use it always gets knotted up yeah and you know, and then depending on your fly, what kind of fly you're using, like how does it, is it spinning when it's in the water? Because if it's spinning, then your line's going to be spinning. So then oh, it gets yeah, tangled yeah, up even sure. more. And then oh, it's yeah. like, I remember when I was first learning how to spay cast and I was teaching myself, uh -huh. you'd be on the river for a couple hours. And then by like after a couple hours, I just want to snap my rod in half because I can't cast, right? It's yeah. like, yeah. I am I love the idea of spay fishing, but I can't cast. I'm hitting yeah. myself in the head with my flies and stuff. It's like, this sucks <laughs> yep. so much. Yep. And then now my fly is spinning because I'm tying these, you know, stupid looking flies that don't work or whatever. Yeah. Like I look back. I don't know, four or five years ago, the stuff I was tying, and I'm like, what was I thinking <laughs> when I first? Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think of when I first really started tying. I remember on Facebook around, I think it's around June time, I get, I'll get a, a, a memory of the first fly I ever tied uh -huh. when I got my first fly rod. Yeah, yeah. And it was this, man, I'm trying to think of a fly that it kind of would resemble kind of like a like a royal wolf okay stimulator sure. type looking thing like that's kind of what it looks like but i wasn't trying to mimic it i was yeah. just like i just went i think at walmart or cabela's and i just bought one of the little kits and it just came with materials and i was like oh yeah i'm gonna go catch a small mouth with this never worked my stuff would lay <laughs> yeah, on its yeah, side yeah. Yeah. i'd be using super glue and it just sink like yeah. you know i didn't know what i was doing so yeah, it's it's really interesting to look at your old stuff and oh, just I look be at like stuff all the time, like clousers that I did. Thinking. I used to cut the bucktail like with with instead of using the natural curve, I just tied on the bucktail at whatever length it was, and then I'd take my scissors and just start trimming <laughs> it to whatever length I That's wanted. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for a while, I sharpied like just white bucktail because that's what I had. So I just sharpie it other colors. And nice. It'd come off in the water. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it would fade <laughs> instantly. Oh yeah. Because I used yeah. to do that too. I just yep. buy white feathers, and then I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna spend all this money on this different colored stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, just color it. And then I'm gonna buy a bunch of white, and then you realize that sucks. So then you just start. <laughs> so then you start buying. Then yeah, you just exactly. buy everything anyway. Yeah, so now yeah. you got a bunch of you know partially faded colored white feathers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I recently found a box of my fishing stuff, and it was yeah. when I first started tying. Yeah, it's funny. My first flies I was tying were two spay tube flies. Never touched a spay rod. <laughs> didn't know anything really about spay. But everybody else that I was tying with, that's what they were tying. So that's yeah, what I yeah. learned. I found this box, and I mean, it just is, is wads of marabou. And <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, and hackle all over in weird spots, and doesn't look right. And you're like. What was I doing? Yeah, yeah exactly. Who, why, yeah. Did, why did I think this was a good idea? That's the funniest <laughs> part is like when you tied them at that time, like I can vividly remember like tying one and being like, oh, this one's this one's perfect. This is it. <laughs> yep. This yeah, looks yeah. like the flies that mm. you buy. Like mm. this is amazing. Mm. And mm -hmm. now I'll look back at it and I'm like, dude, I used like a 
stimulator hackle or something on this size 20 hook <laughs> like the hackle's eight times too large I for it. Yeah. my dubbing's falling off and i got like a, a thread head the size of a yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you're like oh man yeah. what, did, what did i do like how did i think that this is good uh, one time? yeah that's that's for me thread head is like my biggest pet peeve when it yeah. comes to fly tying. Like, oh yeah. Cause it goes back, I think to my OCD where I want everything to be perfect. And yeah. so when I tie flies now, it's like if my, if the head of thread on my fly is like slightly abnormal, I'm like, doesn't work. Not going <laughs> to yeah, throw it away. It bothers yeah. me so yeah. much. Or I'll put it into my backup, backup. Guy yeah, flies. Yeah, yeah. Like that's where those go. Because in my mind, I know it's still going to work. Yeah. It'll probably work great. Actually, yeah. it'll probably work the exact same as that fly. But for but me, it bothers, I, it yeah. bothers me. I want yeah. it to look perfect. Yeah. yeah. You're like, I'm not, I won't fish it, but I mean, if, if they want to fish it, that's cool. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and I yeah. still know 100% it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Saying yeah. like that is not gonna change the effectiveness of the fly. No, no, that's why it's just your personal. Yeah, yeah. Anil got me super into cones when I first started tying for the and it, it, the only reason was he was like, Oh, it'll cover all your thread head. So for such a long time That's everything that I tied was cone heads. That is so you, you could have a giant thread head, but it all just slide underneath right. the cone. Right. Yep. That's my biggest tip for someone starting out fly tying. But just now, use cone heads yep. on everything. So imagine, okay, so imagine you're using orange thread. Yeah. And you got this massive thread head on there. Yeah. So then you put a orange cone on there. Uh -huh. Now are you just creating a more bigger thread head? Like from just the <laughs> yeah, exactly. silhouette and yeah, color, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because when a fish looks at it, they're going to like look over yeah, and, and they're going to go, color. whoa, there's this, you know, medium sized thread head, you know what I mean? And then you throw <laughs> yeah. a cone on there and then it's like, whoa, there's this giant thread head. I'm not eating that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. that guy sucks. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what if, like, what if steelhead, like, you see, so you know how humans, like, guys especially, yeah. like, you know, you look at girls or women and you're like, oh, yeah, she's got nice boobs, right? She's got a nice butt. What yeah. if steelhead had that same kind of thought process when they look at flies? You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, did the you. The proportions are all wrong dude, right did now. You see, no way. Yeah. I'm going did you for see that? the yeah. thread on that one over there, man? <laughs> Damn, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? I think I'm going to go hit that, right? I'm going to go. Like, it's got to yeah. be, like, what if that's it? And I think as spay anglers, we think that, but it yeah. is not even like a thing. You know what Oh, spay guys get yeah. so into I think because you have so much time where you're tying flies and you're just sitting there swinging flies like not hooking anything you've got way too much time on your hands and you're like well, what if I did this and this and this to the fly I better be catching one right now and then you go home and tie a bunch of them but spay guys do like they're the only people I know that would tie like a 40 minute fly when a rabbit leech probably works just as good as like those it crazy does. intruders yeah. if not yeah. better and all the spay dudes want to tie like just insanely difficult like yep this one took me an hour and a half when i spun all these loops and did this crazy stuff and you're like dude i think marabou would create the exact same profile and they're like no nah, I, I grabbed 18 materials and spun them all into this loop it took me at least 30 minutes to make the loop itself you know yeah yeah it's that's in what sucks it's almost like being a your what do you call it you're you're kind of brainwashed when you first start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Because you're you, like you these buy guys who are hype. super into it are throwing these like just casting eighty miles with their line and they're throwing these gigantic flies. That's what I got to yep. do. These yep. crazy flies that are super intricate. When yeah, when I first started, I was on the OPST train hard. I watched yeah. all their videos. That's what got pretty me, much everybody. That's what started, yeah <laughs> started skagit fishing is on the OPST train. Yeah, so that's what got me into spay fishing was watching those and yeah. so all of the stuff you know that's where the whole like intruder kind of yeah, phase oh yeah. kind of stemmed from and i mean so that's then, where the intruder thing came from for everybody right like, the opsd thing comes out rods start getting shorter and like everybody's like these things are so easy to cast and then every line company comes out with a you know a shorter skagit head and everybody's doing 12 foot rods now and it's even you know like it's still happening like guys are still buying shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter rods and uh and, and doing shorter heads too because it's easier to cast than a you know if you'd cast like a 14 foot rod right now with like a 50 foot line which is pretty much the standard um you know in like the 90s 
that's super hard to cast and it's super hard to get turnover with it, especially with sink tips where it's like a 12 foot rod with an OPST line, pretty easy to get turnover, you know, for, especially for a beginner, it's pretty easy to start to get turnover with your setup. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So people, I yeah, I mean, people dug into that and then yeah, big flies for sure. I mean like everybody's tying like, it's not uncommon to see like a five inch total like profile like uh intruder in a guy's box at all now. Well you gotta have it slap it in the face. That's the whole point, <laughs> yeah, it's gotta know? be as big like, as the oh, steelhead that, that you're gonna that catch. Was rude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, but when you think about like plugs that people use the, or oh, if you monsters. think about or if you think about spinners, yep. you know, like think about how big a spinner is. And yeah. Steelhead smoke those things. So yep. it's oh, like yeah. You can totally tie your flies that big. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And so, which and that's and that's another thing about steelhead fishing that is just so because as a spay angler, you get so focused on you know like what we're talking about with flies yeah, and everything, working. and then you just go, you know what, man? But they eat everything, so I don't even think it really matters what yeah. your fly just looks like. It's like just pick a method and just do it perfect. And if there's a fish there, they're probably gonna eat it. Like, because there's so many different ways you can catch a steelhead. So it's like, I don't think there's the best way. It's just no. each way got made for certain types of water. Yeah. So each style of holding water where a steelhead's going to be, there's one perfect, like, method to fish for that. Mm -hmm. You know, to fish to that fish. I would say steelhead are easily as aggressive as coho. Just the numbers are so much less right. that like yeah i mean if there were crazy numbers of steelhead nobody would do anything probably other than swing flies like yeah. you'd be like it's boring i'm catching right. like 30 fish in a day but it's just so hard to get the right conditions so hard to find the fish there's just not that many of them in the river system that it is insanely hard yeah because yeah. i found when a steelhead is in a really swingable spot mm -hmm. and we know they're there and it hasn't been fished to for a while you know yeah. and the fish is rested it's not you know under any stress and you swing a, it's in fairly clear water like let's just say three to four feet and you mm -hmm. swing a black and blue leech in front of it it eats it pretty much every single time yeah and so i think it's i think it's not you know spay fishing your your success rate is not as good not because of you know, it's not an effective way to fish for fish mm -hmm. just because where the fish are going to be holding for those spots to be really good for spay fishing, they just don't happen as much because yeah. that's just not really where steelhead like to live all the time. Mm -hmm. They like to live in dumb spots, they, which is what I call them. Yeah, for sure. Where it's great for bobbers, but it sucks if you're trying to swing because you're probably standing on this little tiny rock on this bluff and like there's this giant hole right there. Because yeah. when it's clear, they like to be where they can't be seen. And that's totally. when you start switching your tips, trying to get it down there. Cable. Yeah. Doing yeah, all sorts yeah, of crazy cable. stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But even then, I mean, I've had fish come up to eat a fly when it's, you know, probably a 15 to 20 foot hole. Yeah, and I move. know there's a bunch of fish in there. Yeah. Cause things to think about is, you know, those fish don't hold right on the bottom for starters. They're for not sure, no. sitting right on the bottom. So if you got a bucket that is 15 feet deep and you know, there's fish in there, you know that they're probably in that from what I've seen, they're usually, like, it all depends on water clarity. They're not going to be that deep. So maybe, you know, eight feet down or something like that. That's mm -hmm. what I've seen when I've drifted over and looked at fish. They're usually in that range, like just beyond yeah. where you can really see them, which is yeah. about that deep. So then if you think about, okay, if they're eight feet, which I, which I feel like is still really deep, mm -hmm. they could even be like six feet to five feet deep. So then yeah. you got to imagine you only really need to get down like, two feet at the most but i feel like a foot could even do it too because if mm -hmm. they're at five feet you're down a foot that's four feet four feet is not that hard for a fish to come up and eat something oh yeah you know what i mean no, i mean especially when when they get in the rivers and they kind of tend to more act like trout than they do like to act like the the salmon in the ocean you know what i mean where they they tend yeah. to they want to kind of because they're they're holding in those feeding spots they're definitely eating up and looking up they're not like nose in the ground like digging the bottom like if your fly is just dredging the bottom you're probably not gonna hook yeah that many fish not and as much as you would if you if you were like two feet three feet off the bottom you'd be doing much better 
Which is basically, I mean, most of the time where you're swinging is like four, five, six feet. So just like you said, a foot to two foot down. Yeah, that's all you really got to do because a lot of times the deeper the water gets, the slower it gets. So you don't even really have to put that much heavier stuff on. No. You know, you just got to put it right in front of that fish. And if they want it, they'll go get it. Yeah. And you can control the speed of it and the depth so easily by mending, not mending, casting downstream, casting upstream. Like you can adjust all that stuff so easily. Yeah. Just by changing your cast. Yeah. There's a lot of, you can, yeah, like you said, you can gain and lose depth instantly with your mending. You For know, sure. it like you could swing a spot and not catch a fish and a guy goes through with the same exact setup and just does a mend a little bit different where his line gets down a little bit deeper, you know, before the fish or, or maybe not even that. Maybe it's just, he just changed the angle of his line. So now it's not ripping across the run. It's yeah. actually coming across slow. slow. Yep. Or broadside versus yeah. tail facing them. Yeah, Whatever. All sorts of stuff. I mean, I've had that happen before where just fishing, fun fishing with some buddies and like literally. I remember the one buddy, he hadn't had a fish for a while, and I was like, dude, I've been getting him in this run, like, not every day, but very often, so I'm sure there's a really, I mean, if we're going to get one, it's going to happen right now, so go ahead and go in front of me, and I was like, use this fly, like, literally, I gave him the rod that caught the fish yesterday with mm-hmm. the same exact setup, I'm like, this should work, it worked yesterday, he goes in front of me, nothing, I had the exact same on, exact same thing on behind him, and I got a fish right at the very end of the run, like, he literally got done, and like, 10 minutes later, I came through and got a fish, so it's like, it's weird, and he's pretty good, too. Mm-hmm. No, it just comes down to what you're doing and how you're swinging it through. But it's always a really good feeling when you have like your buddies go through. Yeah, and you and catch then one. You're the back one, and you're just yeah. like you go to finish, and you hook up, and you're just like, ha ha, guys. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you guys were doing, but I was fishing right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us, Lucas. Cool. Thanks.